Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. I, I've really enjoyed listening to these talks, and um, so far everything I've heard has really just been spot on, including um, what David had to say about the marketing. I think that's just so important to understand where this route's going to go and how we translate what we do in the field into dollars earned. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just get right into it. I'm a grower from central Alabama. I've started a kiwi fruit orchard in 2014. It's, can I go back? Yeah. Um, we, it's a 418 acre total site. It's got a large reservoir of 37 acres and then another 16 acre and then a couple other small ponds that's, that are our main water resource. And there's 175 acres of kiwi fruit and in going into production. It's a gold kiwi fruit orchard and we're only um, growing two varieties, the AU Golden Sunshine and the AU Gulf Coast. Started in 2014. Uh, finished planting last year, so I've got vines of various ages. So what I'm going to talk about is some of the um, challenges and just a typical timeline of so you want to build a kiwi fruit orchard. Some of the things you're going to have to be aware of and obstacles you'll have to overcome. Whenever you get a piece of dirt, it's sometimes going to be a bit rough. We can't have that for our kiwi fruit. We've got to deal to any um, surface drainage issues, um, holes, contouring. So to start with, Gosh, I must be mashing it. Um, so to start with, we deal with the surface, um, contouring, any disking holes that need to be addressed. I like to get the, the fall of the water to a single direction. My orchard is unique. Uh, waterfall, it's hilly terrain. Water falls in many directions. Um, typically, you would pull beds, raised beds in kiwi fruit. Um, that's certainly the standard in China. Um, California. I can't do that because water falls in too many directions. But what we do want to make sure is that we don't have standing water in the orchard. And so we address that. So what I'm just going through is just some of the pre-preparations before we, uh, the ground preparations. So we chisel. So we chisel our rows to break up any ground compaction. We deal to the contouring if it's needed and any sort of drainage issues. We fumigate. I use tellum to uh, address root knot nematode. The soils that we're farming on are sandy, which are conducive to high levels of nematodes. You only get one shot at it, so um, we do fumigate, and there's the, the fumigation rig going through the orchard. That's one of the last things you do. So I've probably made 13 rounds through that orchard. It would have been chiseled a couple of ways, disked a couple of ways, maybe run around with the box blade to deal with holes and humps, knocked out a few terraces. We've um, addressed pH. We've um, probably added some compost or chicken manure at that point, and we've pretty much got it just the way we want it, and then the fumigation rig comes in. After they've done, I've got a field that I can play in. I must be doing something wrong. There we go. So once you've got your field prep ready, we're going to get into uh, subsur subsurface insulation of what the submains. Um, you've got a pretty extensive irrigation system. I'll explain um, in order to do frost protection, you need about 62 gallons per minute per acre, and it all needs to run simultaneously. So you've got to have um, your irrigation system designed for that sort of capacity, and all that will need to be installed, typically before the pergola is constructed. But I get a bit antsy, so what we did was just create alleyways where I can still do simultaneous irrigation installation while I'm ramming posts, and then I'll come back and ram the posts that are adjacent to that. A lot of this has been touched on. That's my, uh, my cane hitter. That's a New Zealand rig. I actually bought it in Texas. So the distributor for cane hitter is in Texas. Um, long, uh, short story. So that's a fantastic machine. Um, very simple. It picks up a 500 pound weight and it drops it from 15 feet. It's got articulation. It's got different rams that can allow for different angles and side shift. This will ram any of the posts that need to be installed on the pergola orchard. I'll show you more specialized equipment though. If you're going to build a kiwi fruit orchard, there's pretty much four pieces of equipment you're going to have to have. That tractor mounted unit that I showed you, you're going to need a skid steer, you're going to need a um, mini X, and you're going to need a telehandler. This is, um, they're going to do different things on different days, but with those four pieces of kit, you can pretty much do everything. With the skid steer, you'll have different attachments. Typically, you will plant your vine and mop it for one year, which really requires no formal training. So it's not necessarily um, 
necessary for you to in fully install the pergola the first year. You can do it in phases. Sorry, it's just more photos of the same, lots of posts. Um, a lot of this stuff's been touched on. Herbicide control needs a spray guard of some sort to uh, keep the, uh, the herbicides off the plant. Root knot nematode is an issue. This is what it looks like. Um, we see it in the field-grown nursery, so we've gone away from field-grown nurseries. I wouldn't recommend going back to field-grown nurseries. Um, containerized nurseries are gonna prevent any sort of nematodes getting into your plant material before, plant, before you put them in your orchard. And then if you can do a fumigation, you've pretty much done the best you can. Uh, the nematodes will come, as they tend to do, but you can just, the best thing to do is to make sure you're planting clean plant material. Um, this orchard, that, that material was not clean. We actually had to dump a lot of plants because of root knot nematode, and that was a sad day, but it had to be done for the, uh, for the, you know, the long-term success of the orchard. So the orchard, um, you can see now some of the continuous cable. Usually by the second year, I've gone through and I've installed the um, 5 16 inch cable and the continuous wire, so it starts to look more like a kiwi fruit orchard. Um, the vines have been grafted at this point, and we're kind of starting their formal training. And what height is that? The, so that cable that you would be walking under is at six and a half foot. The post is rammed to six and a half foot. And then you come 50 mil down for that first leader staple and then another 50 mil for the irrigation. This field is actually, and this is why I put it up here, I wanted to show you different planting patterns. This is double planted opposing females. So this is a high density block that we were using to propagate graft wood. And, and so you can do it this way. And in New Zealand, it's now more common to do double planted opposing female because there's so much money involved and there's such a high demand to get into profit as soon as possible. High density planting obviously does that and then the opportunity to remove plants is always available uh, after you've uh, gotten a couple harvests. The irrigation system on top of that. Yep, that's the poly tubing that is mounted to a wire and that carries the water. That is the frost protection system that is mounted on top of the post. I'm, so I'm not very good at this. Two separate poly. I do. I have a frost and one for. That's rain. right. Yeah, I have a three-quarter inch poly tubing that runs the microjets, and then a one-inch poly tubing that does the overhead. I don't think I'd installed the three-quarter at this this photo, but you'll see it later. Have I'm you sure. used that frost protection every year? Every year. Every year. You got to do a lot of grafting. These are my kids. I taught them taught them how to graft and paint. So uh, these are good tools. Um, they do a really good job of, I can put one of those in a child's hand and um, teach them how to graft, and the biggest mistake they make is they'll graft it upside down. But uh, you got to find a way to hang out with the kids somehow when you work all day. And uh, so a lot of grafting, 47,000 plants on the orchard, every one of them has been grafted at least once. This graft, I'm sorry if I talk too fast, I'm trying to, I realize I have a time constraint. Um, this slide is to remind me to talk about high cane. I call it high cane. Hydrogen cyanamide. Um, so we talked a lot about chilling, chilling requirement, necessary chilling in order to be successful. It's absolutely critical. For the first two years, you know, you'd tie down a good canopy and then the flowers just don't show up because you didn't get enough chilling. You can combat that to a certain extent. Um, hydrogen cyanamide is a fantastic tool for, high, for kiwi fruit for compensating about 25% of chilling. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. Timing is cru critical because uh, it's a double-edged sword. Um, if you apply on the 1st of February, you're gonna have an earlier bud burst, you're gonna have higher freeze risk. You apply on the 14th, you might see flower numbers drop, but at least you're gonna have less freeze risk. Every year, your freeze risk can move forward or backward. So it's, it's a complex situation. It also has an effect on the males and how they synchronize. But it is a fantastic tool, and I certainly am trying to get my head wrapped around it. It was more, uh, in New Zealand, it's far easier to use it because of the smaller uh, frost risk. But um, I mean, it's just amazing what it can do as far as increasing yields and, um, and, and fruitfulness. So it, it's amazing. How do you apply it? Air blast sprayer. Yeah. You just drive through with the air blast sprayer. Yeah, yeah, air blast sprayer, 6% um, at 50 gallons carrier. That's what it looks like when you turn the water on. 
So on cold nights, we use overhead irrigation to protect. I have had a YouTube video. Cool. So I can actually uh, talk while this is running. It's just a, I thought it was a cool visual aid. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so this is the morning of a three-night frost, so I'll just talk while this is happening. We took a massive hit this year. March 3rd, 4th, and 5th, we had a three-day freeze event, so I ran the water for about 72 hours straight. This is probably on day two. You can see a blowout. That sprinkler's not doing what it's supposed to. Um, and so you can... We're running the water constantly overnight to try to protect the plants. On the second night, we actually had high winds that came in, and um, there were 14 mile an hour gusts. And I'm not sure what the sign is, but I think Tim touched on it. It's like evaporative cooling or something. So it's like wind chill, effectively. But what happens is overhead irrigation with wind is never going to work. And that's a really good picture of the whole place. So if you can kind of see, what we have is uh, Gulf Coast varieties in this field and that field. And then we have sunshine in some of these fields out on the edges. And then over there where the water isn't running, that's still in rootstock. And then there's another 20 acres up at the top that's also in, uh, still can, in rootstock. So how cold was it? That night it got down to 22. So... So, yeah, 22 degrees Fahrenheit was the low that night. The, and that's not a bad thing. We can handle that. The, the, the water can handle that. We've got the flow rate to handle it. But you add wind to it, and you lose. You lose the battle. So I'm undersheltered, in my opinion. You can actually see in the very thin gap there where I've planted some arbovitas. If I were to do this orchard again, I would incorporate high artificial shelter to mitigate the wind for the very sheer purpose that every time we have a cold snap that comes in the spring, it's typically associated with a weather front. I've been out there running water when there's wind, snow, uh, rain. It's never just a high pressure system that allows for cold air to drop, which is an inversion sort of freeze where your windmills do a good job. We have these massive storm fronts that come through. And so you can see where I've planted some shelter around the perimeter now. But um, we're undersheltered, in my opinion, and it's really just because of this uh, frost risk. And um, yeah, if that and happens, what are the emitters that you're using there? they're Nelson R10 uh, sprinklers. They produce one and a quarter gallons per minute, and there's 50 of them per acre. What was the date on that? March 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And because of the high cane that I had been experimenting with on a fairly large scale, we had a significant amount of acreage that was really advanced at that time. I had sprayed some on the 1st of February. I'd sprayed some on the 10th. I'd sprayed some on the 14th. The stuff that didn't get sprayed, it did okay. It didn't get as bad. The stuff that got sprayed on the 1st, it was pretty much all out. And by the time this freeze came in, you can cut it off now. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, so what happened for us, and the only reason we still had a crop was because of the stuff that was not high caned. Perfect. Thank you. That worked out. Way to go, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. You're the man. It was, uh, the stuff that wasn't high caned had a real static bud burst, and so there was still stuff that hadn't burst, and after the freeze, the stuff that emerged carried flowers, and that's what we ended up harvesting. And then some of the stuff that was late high caned, same thing. Um, not everything had gone through a bud burst at the time of the freeze event. So high cane works fantastic for increasing yields, but it can also set you up for frost risk. We also get natural cold, just, I mean, like natural sort of ice encasement. This was in January. A um, lot, of, lot of snow fell on that. I think it was something like six inches. It was a bit absurd. Um, I grew up in Alabama as a young person. I don't remember it ever snowing, and now I've seen snow four out of five years, so I don't know what's going on. Um, on, a, on a day like this in January, though, we didn't really get a hell of a lot of damage. Some of the real small plants, you know, what we get is a, a bursting of the trunk, and this is something you have to be aware of. I know there's a lot of research being done on trunk wraps. I don't think any of them work. Um, I personally, yeah, <laughs> just because I've seen it, we've wrapped a bunch of them, and it just don't help. Yeah, it's, it's just not enough for this type of situation. It does work. You probably get some good stats, and you can see that there's a, a good result, but it's not something commercially that I'm going to go run out and, and do. Um, but it makes for pretty photos. 
Yeah. So that was the place under a blanket of snow. That's, that's irrigation another year. So that's actually probably like 2016, judging on the age of the vines and the fact that I hadn't built the pergola. But um, this, what you'll notice, that's not spring. That's late summer. So what we get are these transitional seasons that are also critical. So I've talked about spring frost, but also we're somewhat vulnerable late in the autumn let's say Thanksgiving, November time, when it's just still hot, the plants are still growing, and then we get a cold snap like that. That's when you really see the trunk splitting and the vine death occur. And so it's not, when that happens, I have to make a decision whether or not to run the water, you know? And that's a tough call because you might, it's a, it's a threshold of, okay, let this frost just take off the leaves and put them to sleep, or is this gonna be too much for them too soon and they're not ready for it? And that's a judgment call you have to make just based on the previous trend of weather and what stage of the plants are in. But we can have late autumn frost protection, we can have uh, spring frost protection, and uh, so it's different uses for the same thing. Got a graft, and then the grafts have to be trained. This is a real tedious time of year. Uh, we've talked a lot about stringing, but you can imagine the labor that goes into putting every one of these shoots, making sure they go under the wire, not over the wire. You don't get limb rub. You got one on each string. That one doesn't jump on the other string. So it's a real um, tedious time of year to get the, the vine training right. But I highly encourage stringing as a commercial tool to get you into production. This can easily take a year if not two years off of the timeline of getting the full canopy. So in one year, one year after grafting, we can grow leaders and replacement cane and get you to nearly a full canopy in a perfect situation. So that's, that just can't be done without strings. So it really does save you a lot of money, the time. Yeah, I budget about $2,200 per acre for the labor content of stringing. But that includes putting up the poles, putting up the strings, and then all the fastidious, tedious walking around. Um, and I kind of base that on $11 an hour, so I think it's what, 110 hours an acre. A lot of walking around, but it starts to come together after a while. You get the, the canes going up and um, you're starting to get your uh, replacement cane. You can sort of see what's going to happen. Different ways of doing it. This is, uh, I put a pole in the middle in here because this was a graft wood block. It was a posing female. You can put the pole in different places. Um, that bringing us to bloom. Uh, so now I'm, I think I'm talking about pollination. And we've talked about this. You know, obviously you require pollination. Things that I do, um, I use bumblebees in combination with honeybees. In uh, New Zealand, I would use nine to 10 hives per hectare, which is about four to five hives per acre. Um, that's just the normal ratio. And now I've done a split plot where it's about two to three bumblebee quads or bumblebee units, which is four to a quad, um, and an equal number of honeybees. I also use artificial pollen it's real pollen, but applied through artificial means. Um, I like the bumblebees. Uh, they was totally new to me. I'd never used them in New Zealand, but they've got a really good work ethic, and we can have some cold and windy days that the honeybees just won't work. And stigma receptivity on a gold kiwi fruit's really only about 48 hours. So you really have a small window to get that bee visit, and even though it may only need a handful of bee visits, if you don't get it done in that short window, it's, it's not going to be an ideal pollination. Uh, bumblebees are ground-dwelling bees, so I build these little structures for them to live under as I place them in the orchard. I also find that it's just really easy to move around. I can shuffle bumblebees around really easily. They're, they're kind of convenient like that. So I can chase the bloom where my honeybee hives just kind of stay where I left them. Another thing with, I could talk a little bit about pollination is... Um, managing your bee colonies going into pollination. There's really not a, a tremendous nectar source for bees to forage on when they go into the orchard, so you gotta have supplemental sugar syrup in the feeders um, so that they don't starve. Another thing we talked about was orientation and pollinating under artificial. Um, orientation's important, but also that first flight is typically for water, and so staging water troughs in the orchard near your bee 
um, drops is going to keep them from, again, um, foraging too far away or possibly not having a good return flight. So little tricks of the trade that can help to keep your, your bees in the orchard because they do want to bugger off because it's not the most, it's like trying to pollinate cucumbers. They don't want to be there. Um, you also stagger their drop. So I might bring, let's say, half of the hives in at about 10% bloom, and I bring the other half in at 50% bloom. If you bring them all in too soon, as I said, they get discouraged, and they stop foraging, and then you've lost most of your bees during your peak bloom. So you, you trickle in the hives so that the um, fresh bees kind of, uh, they, they work the flowers a little bit harder the first couple days. So little tricks to managing your, your bees during bloom time. You got to have the right male though. It, it's got to synchronize. You need to have that synchronization so that you can get the males open when the females are. We're doing a lot of playing around with um, girdling males, uh, different types of males. I think there's six different male varieties on the orchard that we're evaluating. Um, they behave differently different years. We've mentioned that. High cane has Dormex or hydrogen cyanamide has an effect on them. Girdling's having an effect on them. Whoops. How did you figure that out initially? I mean, you just went out there. Those varieties? Yeah, I mean, in which males to put out? Like, that was more of the research, you know. So um, it's recommended that CK3 pollinates dragon, tiger pollinates sunshine, and Gulf Coast as really kind of in a gray area where it doesn't have a perfect male. So those were your starter males. I put chieftain in because it's just a backbone and it's good for the harvest of pollen which is what this slide's about. Um, and then once I realized we weren't quite hitting the nail on the head, I started to experiment with other ones from UC Davis and some other breeders. Artificial pollen was mentioned. Um, this is an effective way of applying it. So in that jar, you have a yellow baby powder that is the pollen, and then you have a variable speed drive, which my hand is obstructing here, where I can dial in the variable speed drive to get the rate that I want and then you just drive through the orchard uh, dusting the, the flowers with pollen. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is you ask the kids to come in and you give them little hand puffers. This works really well. I mean, perfect pollination. Uh, hands down, I love, if I can get 20 people out in the field with these, I feel, I put it in the diary as that field's pollinated. Because you're literally visiting every flower and just giving it the tiniest puff. It doesn't use as much pollen. I use less than 100 grams but there's a high labor input, but the pollination's outstanding, so the kids do a good job. Brings you the thinning. Thinning is, is a big old job. Um, that's a before and after. I thought that was just one example, but this is what they want to do, and then this is what you need them to do. Um, as a manager, you got to go through, and it's hard to teach people. I think Tim mentioned that. Um, you got to simplify it as much as you can. You can pull off things like triples, which is one flower and it'll have two side flowers. Pull off your triples, pull off your fans. Those are misshapen ones. Um, those are easy. You can kind of send a crew through and you can give them a time that you expect them to be moving at and you can march them through the orge to remove doubles and triples. But then when you get to this sort of stuff, it becomes a little more complicated. And you can see in the background, there's actually a fairly high density throughout the whole thing. So at that point, what we do is, uh, I do, is uh, I do a lot of fruit counts. I go into a bay, I'm counting the total number of fruit, I'm coming out with averages. I still work in fruit per square meter, so then I figure out that I want to be around 70 fruit per square meter. I look at my actual counts, I then come up with some sort of scenario, some sort of simple rule that I can give them based on the numbers. And that might be, um, I need you to reduce all the trusses from five to three, or I need you to strip all of the fruit in a single wire. And so you try to find these efficiencies that are going to allow you to move these people through the orchard. Otherwise, you just got, it, it just grinds to a halt and people don't know what to pull off. Ki thinning kiwi fruit can be a bit of a mission. Um, are they, do you just pull them off? Or you yeah, just, just pluck them, them off. off. And I like flower thinning. So you, I'm, and that's not a good point. I should, so this is, this is getting into the late thinning. We've obviously gone through pollination, now we're fruit thinning. I prefer to flower thin. So when flower thinning is triples and flats, breaking out shoots, we often, I'll just tell people, I want to see a hands width in between fruiting clusters, so that can involve breaking out shoots. And those are the type of things you can do efficiently for 
five out, five man hours an acre and just march them through. And then you get into fruit thinning and it gets a little more complicated. But it has to be done. That fruit, that cane had 90 fruit on it. They're all good size. I left them alone. So it was kind of funny. That's a Gulf Coast plant. Gulf Coast does a pretty good job. Um, again, these photos don't really look that good on the big screen, but I was just trying to show nice crop volume. Good cane spacing. So at winter pruning, you can see that 16 inch cane spacing. So the pruning was done well. A lot of things can be solved at winter pruning. If you do a good job at winter pruning, you can really set yourself up for almost no summer pruning and hopefully as little thinning as possible. And there are vines wanting to like grow to hang down and grow down. They do. Yeah, it's a bit of a job. Go through, and that's kind of part of summer pruning, is to shove the canopy up in or trim the canopy so as to, um, it's just a health and safety hazard for the mowers and the sprayers that they'll have canes, you know, trying to tomahawk them. As again, a winter pruning, it's, it's kind of out of sequence, but you can, again, you can see the good cane spacing. And so that's kind of the structure that you want of a vine. I brought this up, and it, it actually fits in well. We talked about stringing and replacement cane pruning and how do you do it. Uh, typically, cut out the old, tie down the new one, especially if you've got strung canes. But this is the more complicated version of winter pruning. It's highly productive. It's actually hayward pruning. It's called low vigor pruning. And um, this type of pruning is extremely productive, but it's difficult to teach people, especially when they're new to it. And uh, the way I explain it in simple terms is we call it fish boning. And so what you've got is a backbone right here, and then you've got the ribs that come off of that backbone. And we kind of call that fish boning. And we're still trying to maintain the spacing of 14 inches between the, the fruiting canes. And, um, and with that type of technique, you can really start to fill out your canopy. If you can get the pruners to understand this technique, they usually don't leave too many holes. So there's challenges with training your staff. And all this has to be done with hands. So that brings us to the, the topic of labor and who do you have to work with. I think the next few slides are just pictures of fruit. Um, this is getting right up until harvest. This is the Gulf Coast variety. Um, it does produce some very um, nice size fruit. Uh, the sunshine is probably slightly larger, but the sunshine has issues with fruit drop. Sorry. Um, sunshine is a fantastic looking fruit. It does produce nice size. It's also very, um, very physically, the surface of it looks very much like G3. So it's kind of easy to compete with G3 cosmetically, but unfortunately it's difficult to grow due to the fruit drop and poor storage that we seem to be incurring. Um, that's more sunshine. Okay, so now um, this is actually a talk I did for um, a talk in New Zealand. They asked me to speak on the subject. And so this is last year's information, but I'll talk about BMSB, brown marmorated stink bug. Um, this is currently where be the range of BMSB. As y'all mentioned, you're in this area where it's kind of been seen, but it's not a problem. I'm in this area where it's a problem, but it's not a pandemic. pandemic. And then the red is obviously where it's the worst. This thing started in New England, and it's just moved its way down. And now what we have is, I think, L, Alabama should change its color because it's pretty bad where I'm at. Um, it's just going to continue to move. It is a poly host. It doesn't care what it's on. It can feed and complete its life cycle on anything um, from a pine tree to a landscape host. It, it's just it's an absolutely devastating um, thing. If you want to learn more about it, this is a fantastic website. There's a tremendous amount of research dollars coming from the federal government going to these research institutes to try to solve these problems. And this is a dumping ground for all these universities to put their information out there so it's available to the public. StopBMSB.org. It's a good resource. And if you want to learn more about it, I encourage you to go there. Whoops. Um, in Alabama, this is 18. I'll tell you a little bit about 19. But in 18, we had about 50% damage post-harvest. We lost most of the crop. This year, I'm say like 3%. Brown. Brown marmorated stink bug damage looks like this. So they come in, they stain the fruit. You can't see it unless you cut the top off. So there's no physical way to identify this fruit. And some of it's still sound. You're harvesting it. It's still firm. It looks good. And then you cut it open and you find out. Had you seen the stink bugs out 
Yeah, no, you can physically see them. They're a large insect. More was lost due to pre-harvest drop. When the when the when brown armored sink bug stings the fruit, minor damage you can't see it until post-harvest. Severe damage it'll drop the fruit. Um, we've only got a couple of sprays that are available. Esfen Valley Rate, which is the Asana product, really almost has zero control, um, but it's the only one registered for kiwi fruit. And there are some organic products, which aren't half bad, the pyrethrums. And there's one called Evergreen, which is a pyrethrum with um, an IGO. And it's not a bad product. It, it does have some knockdowns. So we do have those two. But it's an EC. And I'm, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around some of the phytotoxicity issues with applying that in the summer. But um, it, it does have some knockdown. We do, um, actually, I'll get into it. So this is the damage. More of the damage, as I said, you can't see it at harvest, and it really starts to show up after harvest, after a couple of weeks in storage. So monitoring is really important. You can physically go walk the rows and, and monitor for the insect, the adults. You can see eggs on fruit. Um, these, stink these stink bug traps work really well. We experimented with yellow ones, black ones, tall ones, small ones. We hunt some from stringing poles, some from the wire. We concluded that the medium yellow HUD at Hained at um, head height was the most effective, and it's not uncommon for these to catch more than 100 in a week, sometimes more. And um, they're baited with an aggregation pheromone, and they have a kill strip inside, which is actually a cattle ear tag. So we made these. I'm, once I figured out what was working this year, so this was last year, this year I made over 300 of them and I have them everywhere around the perimeters of the orchard. It's been a very effective tool. It's stopping this insect at the boundary and it's killing them while I sleep. It's also been a good monitoring tool for me to be able to target my uh, perimeter sprays, which I can use other, commodity, other um, registered products. And then it's also been useful for timing my internal orchard sprays. And we went from 50% to less than 5% in one year. It's called an aggregation pheromone, specific for brown marmorated stink bug. You can get it from the Trece, T-R-E-C-E -E company. Uh, there's two of them out there, but I recommend the Trece brand. Oh, okay, so yeah, like I said, we did different trials. We graft when they show up. They're a late season pest. They kind of peak in July and August, but they're, they're around through September and October. And this is right when I'm trying to pick. So you, you bust your hump all year. And to get it to this point, and that's really when they move in like a plague. But much better this year. We did trap cropping. I don't recommend it. It doesn't work. Um, the problem with trap cropping is there's nothing out there more attractive than a kiwi fruit for 200 days of the year. So you can have a sunflower will attract them, or a sorghum, or a buckwheat, but that's going to be attractive for a small moment. And then they're just going to bugger off to the kiwi fruit. What actually worked for me is I had about 47 acres of kiwi fruit that had some fruit on it that wasn't marketable because it's just not economic. There, wasn't, there were young vines with some fruit hanging on it. That made a pretty good trap crop. And I would go over there and spray it. So I'm trying to wrap my head around that one. But we did a lot of different commodities. We put them outside the rows, inside the rows. And this is, you know, I'm kind of learning from some of the, the old boys around Alabama is that when they use trap crops, you really have to have a perfect perimeter. You can't have any holes, any barriers. So unless you've got a, a perfect square that can be compartmentalized and it doesn't have significant elevation changes that you could plant and then have a staggered planting so that you have an attractive trap crop for the entire period of vulnerable, then I suppose you could, you could use it to some effect. Uh, we would use them as bait and kill stations. So I would go scout the trap crops, and then when I saw that they were there, I would come and spray them and just use it as a knockdown. I was a trial to look at effectiveness, so I actually knew that there was a bunch of insects on that. I sprayed it, and then I watched to see how many dropped. So I think there was 30, 32 or 30 plus insects present on this male at the time of the application, and I managed to kill six. So the problem is they just fly off. You know, you come through with an air blast sprayer, they fly off, and then they come back. Yeah. What about, uh, spray yeah, night spraying's been the way for me this year, and it's hard, because we did so many things this year, it's hard to tell which one worked. Which one took us from 50 to 5%. But this year, there was a combination of an aggressive trapping program, 
an aggressive spray program around the perimeter. We changed our spray pattern from day times to night time. Uh, these are a nocturnal pests. They're out there foraging at night. Um, so we changed our spray patterns, and then we got two Section 18s for a, a pyrethroid and a neonic, so we had these additional chemicals that were also effective. So all of those things added up to a huge drop in our, pro in our pest problem, um, but it's hard to tell which ones made the biggest. This is kind of obsolete because but, it was a year ago, and now we've done all those things. Yeah, I've got to show you what you can catch in a day. Or in a Insects, you could actually pluck the wires and see the little guys fly off. Um, this year, we were so good with our control that all we could really find were eggs. And so it became, a, we would just smush eggs whenever we saw them. But that also gave us some confidence that even though obviously adults are laying the eggs, we weren't physically seeing the adults in high numbers. So we were um, convinced that we were having some good of efficacy. Uh, this is a different issue. Um, although it doesn't show, it's kind of the worst case scenario of ambrosia beetle. So ambrosia beetle, a little insect, and it comes in and it drills a hole. Typically the, the symptoms you're looking for are, it looks like cigarette ash coming out of your trunk, and then they have a fungal garden and it clogs up the vascular system. Kiwi fruit's a very soft wood and they seem to like it. And when it gets bad, you get this cankerous looking exudates and it'll kill a vine. Uh, actually had a significant loss. Um, I wasn't even aware that it was going to be an issue, and then we became aware. Again, um, monitoring is critical. It's right around February. They do one flight, and if you can time your sprays right when they are out, um, you can pretty much knock them down. So we didn't have a problem with them this year, I think, because of that spraying, and we were monitoring using ethanol lures and these little traps that we built. So brown marmorated stink bug, ambrosia beetle, we've mentioned scale, leaf-footed bug. These are kind of your major pests. Could you, could you check, catch all those beetles for bugs in those traps? Well, the ethanol lure for the ambrosia beetle, yeah, that thing will catch anything. Ethanol lures are really, really attractive to just about anything. So then you got to actually go through the, the collection and make sure that you're looking for an ambrosia beetle, which is a very small, it's a small insect. Yeah, there's a bunch in there. Uh, the brown marmorid stink bug traps are really specific. You only catch stink bugs and sometimes some wasps that are trying to get. But for your, your neonic, um, was that foliar or drench? It's a foliar. Yep. Okay. And then so it was section 18, they give you a PHI on it or you just. Yeah, yeah. so the Danatol product is a 21 day PHI and the um, Scorpion is a 7 day. And they're only good for a year, but we're going to renew them. And I think we're working towards getting label registration. And there's also simultaneously some IR4 work happening in California for bifenthrin, which would really be the, the product of choice is to have bifenthrin available for kiwi fruit. And it's just a little bit of bureaucracy. It's unfortunate because, you know, in other parts of the world where this uh, commodity has established itself and you know these chemical companies have come to the party but now we're a new thing new commodity we're a small uh, client for any chemical company and so it's difficult to get them on board but we are getting we are making progress and so I, I feel we'll be there in another year or two hopefully with a bifenthrin with a label um, getting close to harvest I think I took this picture just a few days ago before we picked a block Grow some nice big fruit. That's some Gulf Coast. Some more Gulf Coast. Doc's got big hands too, so I don't know if that does the scale, but those are probably 140, 150 grams. Um, looks nice on the vine. That looks like more Gulf Coast. These are just, just bragging photos. You know, it looked nice before harvest. And there it is in the box. And that's what you want. Nice yellow kiwi. We had issues a year ago with degreening. Uh, the years I was trying to grow all the canes upstream, we actually had a small crop hanging there on the leaders. And I wanted to harvest that crop, but also I wanted to grow a lot of replacement canes. So I was pushing the nitrogen pretty hard. And inadvertently, what I ended up doing was with applications in late July to push the canopy, we ended up affecting uh, degreening. We had a lot of green kiwi fruit as opposed to gold. And so that was a lesson learned. And, um, and so now I've moved that, I took that fertility right out and stopped it in June. And I was glad to see that the color returned. 
do you harvest? Do you bring in um, people to harvest? Or do you send crew? And <coughs> and everybody, yeah. Uh, we rely on H2A. Uh, for a small crew, we're a pretty small orchard, 175 acres, doesn't take a huge amount of people to harvest it. Kiwi fruits, I think you mentioned, is 300 pounds an hour. I mean, I, I say a bin, one bin an hour per person is my expected harvest rate. Good pickers can do more. If the fruit's big, you can do more. Um, picking's not the hardest thing. Winter pruning is. So really the H2A come in right at the end of harvest, but really what I need them for is winter pruning, which is the most tedious problem. You pull them off or you cut them, cut them with blocks? You pull, you pluck them off. That's a good question. And then this happened just the other day. No. Beware the forbidden fruit. That was me. I harvested that one fruit that it was hiding behind. And uh, yeah, it gave me a fright. So yeah, I tried to run through that. But if you all have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay. Well, bloom's an easy time of year to tell, and then it's kind of like just being able to identify different oak trees. You can look at the leaf, you can look at the, the bark and sort of make a decision based on that, which variety it is. But it's pretty hard to tell the difference if they're not blooming. But if you're familiar enough with the plants, you can sometimes make, some are really easy to identify, like CK3. Yep, they're always gonna be male or female, one or the other. You're never going to have a, a, a two for special. I do have plants that I've grafted, both male and female, and so there's one male trunk, one female, but you won't have them like on the same plant, typically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.